Well, good evening, everyone. Lovely to have so many people joining us for this session. My name is Anne, and I'm going to be taking you this evening through some tasks within the Drafting and Interpreting Financial Statements Unit. So the session is advertised to run for about 30 minutes, depending on how much we've got to do in a session. Sometimes they are a little bit longer. So um, if you do need to hop off after 30 minutes, not a problem. You will be receiving the recording. So you are welcome to leave if you've got other plans. But uh, chances are this evening that I actually wanted to look at two tasks. Um, I thought if we did task six on its own, it perhaps wouldn't be enough to fill our 30 minute slot. And um, task six and task seven belong really well together. So I thought they'd actually make a good combination. So I think what we'll do is we'll do task six and then we'll do the majority of task seven. There might be a section of that that um, I, I don't bother with, but I'll make sure that you get an answer sent out to you with the recording. So hopefully everybody has a copy of the questions that we're going to be using. So if you are a first intuition student, the questions that we're going to be using are the first intuition mock one. If you are not a first intuition student, you should have received a link from us to be able to download our question pack, which has a first page looking something like this. So before we go any further, does anybody actually need a copy of these questions? If I don't hear anything in the chat box. Oh, yeah, somebody does. OK, yeah, OK, let me just pop then. Then. Oh, that's interesting, Paul, I'll have to check on that. Yeah, OK, it looks like everybody wants. So let me just uh, get those into the chat box for you then. And then you'll have them for future sessions. We actually use the same. Oh, my desktop is such a mess, as you can see, all this stuff on there. Where are we? Day fusion. There we are. Revision questions. That's what I want. OK, so they're on their way into the chat box there. So we use the same Zoom link for each week. So you can use the same Zoom link and we'll use the same question pack each week as well. So the questions have turned up there now, as far as I can see from my side in the chat box. So they're available for you as a download. So as I said, if you are an FI student, it's our FI Mock 1. If you're not an FI student, then you'll need this little question pack. So these are just the questions. We don't give you the answers because the answers we're going to work through together. That's the point of the session. All right, let's just make that a little bit bigger, make it a little bit easier for us to see. There we are. So we're going to actually, as I said, go straight down to task number six. And the reason I chose tasks six and seven for this evening is because they tend to be an area students don't like. I think task six in itself is probably OK. But task seven is definitely less popular. Um, and I thought task six was a nice introduction to this topic. And task seven is then um, written questions, which, of course, nobody likes. So I thought they'd be a good one to do as well. So, Zara, you will receive a recording of this session by email. And that recording can also include a link to download the questions. We don't include the PDF of the questions in our email, but you can certainly download from the, the link that we're going to be uh, sending with that email. And you will get the um, the annotated version of the questions that we've done. So they'll come out tomorrow. So the plan for today then is tasks six and seven. So very much concentrating on the interpretation of financial statements. And as I said, I chose these because I think these tasks are not really popular. I think for two reasons, partly because there's a lot of ratios to learn. And even if we've learned it, understanding what they actually tell us, which is what we need to be able to do in task seven, is, uh, is something different again. So quite important that you improve this skill, that you can calculate these ratios and that you can then talk about them within task seven. Now, if this is your first time seeing our first intuition materials, you will see that for each task, we start with something called a task briefing. We actually, even before the task briefing, we just chat to you about what this task covers. So task six is about interpreting of financial statements using ratios. The task is worth eight marks, which gives us about 10 minutes to complete it. Then there's a task briefing and the task briefing is really just a revision. So if you know that you are weak on this particular area, 
you know that you really need to put an extra bit of learning or an extra bit of revision into this topic, then that task briefing is for you. Think of it as a set of revision notes. So it goes through some technical material that this task will cover. So in this case, it chats through all the different ratios in their headings. So profitability ratios, liquidity ratios, re ratios relating to use of resources and so on. So they're all there. Important that you learn all those, so they're all summarised there, so hopefully that will be helpful for you. What I wanted to do is actually get straight into the question practice, and then you can, in your own time, go over the other ratios that are not covered by this task and make sure that you do understand those. You should have materials already from whatever books you've bought from your learning provider. So if you need a little bit more detail than we've added, we have included in our revision material, then feel free to go back to your um, original course materials. So here we've been given the financial statements of Tumbleberry for the year ended December XD6. You are required to prepare financial ratios to assist your manager in his analysis of the company. So here we have Tumbleberry. And Tumbleberry has a statement of profit or loss for the year ended December XD6. So that should look quite standard to us, should look quite familiar by the time we get to this point in our revision. Of course, earlier tasks are getting us to prepare this thing from scratch, so we should certainly um, be able to understand what it looks like. And we've also got a statement of financial position as at December X to six, so the end of that year. Again, should look very familiar to us by this point. We've then got some ratios that we need to calculate. And each of these ratios has to be calculated to two decimal places. This is going to be a little bit of a test of memory for us, isn't it then? Perhaps this will highlight for us any ratios that we haven't yet learnt. So let's see what you can remember. So the first one that we are faced with then is our current ratio. Can anybody remember how to calculate a current ratio? Perhaps using the chat box, you can tell me if you remember the formula for that one. How do we calculate a current ratio? It's gonna open up a new page so my workings don't get too cramped. Excellent, getting some answers coming through. Seems like that one's a popular one. I bet that oh, you've all been studying really hard, so well done. And you are spot on. The current ratio is the current assets compared with the current liabilities. So current assets to current divided by our current liabilities. And then that will give us a, a current ratio to show what are our current assets compared with the current liabilities. And it is a measure really of our liquidity. So let's think as we do these, what these ratios actually tell us. So it's a measure of how able we are to use our assets, our short-term assets to pay our short-term debts. How liquid are we? So it would be the equivalent of you and I sort of looking at maybe how much money we've got in our bank and how we are going to be able to pay our credit card bill when it comes due or how we can pay our mortgage when that's due in the next week or two. So what do I need to pay in the shorter term and what assets have I got available to do that? So now I know that, can I go back to here and find the figures that I need then? Can you find the current assets? What's the figure I need for current assets? Pick those out here. Nine hundred and ninety-two. If I add those up, that's my little current assets section. So current assets, those three things together, equals nine nine two. It's the inventory, the trade receivables, the cash and cash equivalents. Do not be fooled into taking the total assets figure. That includes the non-current assets as well. You want just the current assets. So yeah, Charlotte, just be super careful there. 
Total assets means your long-term things like the PPE. We want just the current ones. So we do have to actually add those up for ourselves. So definitely something to watch for in future. And then our current liabilities. So looking down this statement of financial position, I've got some non-current liabilities. Well, that's not what it said. It said, formula said current liabilities. So just these two then. And again, I'm not going to use that total because that's a total of equity and liabilities. I want just the current liabilities. So 297, I got there. Lovely. Seems like we're agreeing on that one. So when I then come to calculate this, the current ratio is going to be, as we said, current assets. Divided by my current liabilities. So what did we have there? 992. 297. So we divide that out. It said to two decimal places. So that gives me 3.34. And that tells me that my current assets are 3.34 times whatever the current liabilities are. So if the current liabilities were one pound, the current assets would be three pound 34. If the current liabilities were 10 pounds, the current assets would be 33 pounds 40 and so on. So it's all about proportions, but I can see that I have definitely got lots of assets available to cover my short-term debts. The next one then is return on capital employed. Does anybody remember how to calculate this one? I'm going to start writing it out while you maybe type it out while you start thinking about it. Good. So the return on capital employed, I think looking at what it, its name suggests, it's the return, the return therefore being a profit, that's what returns are, the amount that we make, divided by the capital employed, so that's the amount invested. So the return in this case is the profit and the capital employed is the amount that we have invested in the business. So it's operating profit, or sometimes it's called the profit before interest and tax. That's a very descriptive way of where to find it within our profit and loss account, divided by the capital employed. And capital employed can be found in two different ways. I just want to just revise that with you. Capital employed could be total assets, less current liabilities. So total assets, less current liabilities. Now we can find our total assets figure within the statement of financial position. We then deduct the current liabilities, which we already know, that would give us the capital employed. Now it's sometimes found another way around as well. And we can also find it by saying, well, that is actually the same as the investment in the business. So if you look at the amount of equity that's invested, that's the investment made by shareholders. And if you add that to the amount of non-current liabilities or debt, so we add that to our long-term liabilities, that shows the amount invested by debt providers, we find the amount of money that's invested. Money and capital are meaning the same thing, really, in this respect. So capital means money employed. It's talking about the resource, perhaps, better way of saying it, the resources that are employed. So if we look at what the shareholders have invested and what the debt providers have invested, that tells us the total amount invested then, or the amount of capital that's employed to work in the business. So that's how we calculate capital employed. I thought that was worth a little bit of revision here. So should we find the figures? Operating profit first. 
There it is. Also known as the profit before interest and tax, because here's the profit after the tax. That's the final profit figure. I'm basically working backwards and so well, I don't want that one. That was after the tax. This is the profit before the tax, but still not quite good enough. I need the profit before the interest and the tax, also known as operating profit. So this one here. And that is going to be divided by the capital employed. Let's get that one written down to start with. So divided by the capital employed. And remember, we said we could find that in one of two ways. It could be that we take the amount of equity that we have invested, which is here. That's the money invested by shareholders. And we add it to the amount of money invested by our debt providers. So that is the capital, the funds that have been invested by our investors. Some of those investors are shareholders, the other investors are debt, given as loans. And together, it tells us the amount of capital that they have. Oh, why have I put employment? <laughs> Carried away there. Capital employed. So it comes out at 25315 on my calculations there. You agree with that? Now, if you prefer, you can do it the other way around. We said you could also calculate it as total assets, which would be here, less current liabilities, which are down here. So total assets, less current liabilities would give me the total assets figure, 25612, minus my current liabilities of 297. Let's just check that actually does work. And it does. So we come out to 25315. Okay, so there we go. 25315 is my capital employed figure. So we've got the return made as a proportion of the amount invested. And this is a very commonly used and a very important ratio. In real life, this one is used a lot. To two decimal places, 20.28. So that's the return that has been made, the profit the business is generating before it pays the interest and the tax, the profit that the directors are responsible for, you might say, divided by the amount that they've actually got invested in order to make that profit. So 20.28 there. We then need an asset turnover. Asset turnover, and then it says brackets net assets. Anybody remember how to calculate that one? I'll jot it down on here for you. Whoops. Excellent. So its name says asset in it and its name says turnover in it. So that's a little bit of a giveaway. It's perhaps just a case of getting these the right way around. What we need is our turnover figure or sales, if you like. Divided by our net assets. And it really just shows me if I take the value of the net assets, so I have a look at the value of the net assets in the uh, in the company and I say how many times their own value can they generate in sales? So if the net ass assets were £10 and the turnover was £20, as an example, the asset turnover would be two. You'd say the assets generated twice their value in turnover. So that's what the ratio shows me. Take the assets, how many times that value can they generate in sales? or turnover. So having a look at this one then, let's find our turnover figure. 
So the turnover here is 14652. divided by the net assets. So let's have a look, what do we know? Well, we know the total assets are 25612. So if total assets are 25612, the net assets would be 25612, and then it deduct your current liabilities. So 25612 minus the current liabilities to find the net assets rather than the total assets. It did specifically say to calculate it based on net assets. So I need to get those current liabilities out of there. So in this case, that actually comes out at 0.58 to two decimal places. OK, a couple of questions that have come through. Um, a direct message here. So turnover and sales, yes, they're both the same thing. So turnover and sales are the same thing. Revenue is how it's called actually in our statement of fact, um, instead our statement of profit and loss here. So lots of names for the same thing. So I'm looking at this figure, revenue, sales, turnover, all meaning the same. And let me just check what your question was uh, referring to here. Paul, um, how can we don't take the non-current assets out? You mean from this net assets figure? Is that what you meant? The net assets basically means add all your assets together, but then strip out your current liabilities. So it's just the meaning of net assets. Net assets specifically means non-current assets, the current assets and then deduct the current liabilities. Perhaps what you're thinking of is the net current assets. That's perhaps what, where your mind has gone, Paul, which is not a problem at all. Something to remember for next time. If we have to find our net current assets, then you would take current assets, less current liabilities. Why this page has suddenly gone a bit skew. I was just going to jot that down for you, just as a reminder. So net current assets is a different thing. And if the question wanted you to work with that, it would specifically say so. So that is current assets, less current liabilities. So that, just the word that, of current there being missing makes a huge difference to our actual answer. So net assets and net current assets are different things. So I hope that helps. Okay, and then the next one is gearing. Does anybody remember how to calculate gearing? While well, we're on this page, we might as well jot that down. Does anybody remember the calculation for gearing? Excellent. Now, gearing is a really funny one because it can actually be calculated six different ways. But unless you're told otherwise, you will always calculate it this way. So we're going to take the debt figure, as uh, Isa suggested. It is going to be the debt. And by that, I mean the long term liabilities. I'm not talking about debt being a supplier that we haven't paid yet that's due next week. I'm talking about the finance from our long-term loan providers, the debt or the long-term liabilities divided by the debt and the equity together. So there are more than one, there is more than one way to calculate gearing. We use this one unless a question tells us to do anything differently. So here we have then, going back to our statement of financial position, we have a debt figure somewhere here, the non-current liabilities, so the debentures, 6,000, the equity of 19315, 
They're the figures that we need again here. We've used those already as part of our capital employed workings. Well, we need them again now for gearing. So the debt divided by the debt and the equity all together. So it's, what's that? 23.7%. Okay, so what do you think of those calculations? My opinion about this question is that you can absolutely do these if you've learned them. If you haven't, you can't. So it's actually quite simple in a way. <laughs> you either have learned them or you haven't learned them. And if you have learned them, then you can do them. And if you haven't learned them, then you can't. So you have absolutely got to learn them. So that was just four of them. And um, I'd started this session with the intention of actually going through and working on some of the next task as well. And already looking at the time, I don't think we're going to get to all of task seven. So I think we might actually do that next week and then we can have a whole session on task seven. So I think what I'm going to do with the remaining time in this session is maybe go back to the task briefing and run through a few more of these ratios with you. So we can just chat about what they calculate. We can chat a little bit about what they tell us. And that will then perhaps put you in a better place for doing task seven next Next week anyway. So I think we're just going to focus on this one task for this evening, a slight change of plan, but I think we will be too rushed to try to get all of task seven in and it's a great task and I really don't want to rush it, but hopefully we can spend a bit of time going through some of the other ratios that will help you in future. Okay, let's do that. Do let me know if there's any questions in the chat box. So let's maybe run through some profitability ratios then. Now, if we just visualise, I don't think we've got everyone here, haven't we, actually, a um, profit and loss statement, just reminding ourselves about the layout of that. You see, we have revenue, less cost of sales, gives gross profit. And my gross profit margin says, well, how much gross profit do we make for every one pound sold? So the gross profit margin is the gross profit divided by the revenue figure. And it tells me the amount of profit per one pound sold. So gross profit divided by revenue multiplied by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So if the gross profit percentage was, let's say, 45 percent. That means that the gross profit is 45 pence in every one pound of sales. So it's showing you a proportion of every pound sold, how much do you get to keep back as gross profit, gross profit being the bit just between sales and uh, cost of sales. So what's different when we get to operating profit margin? Well, operating profit margin then deducts our extra costs, things like admin expenses and distribution costs and all these other costs involved in running our business. Our operating profit margin of, say, 20 percent then means that the operating profit is 20 pence in every one pound of sales. Now, I'm not going to go through absolutely every single ratio with you. I'm going to pick out what I think are the big and the important ones. And these are a really good start in doing that. So what I'm also going to do over here is just a little illustration, let's say, of a company over two different years. So year one and year two. So let's say in year one, the company has a gross profit of 45%. And in year two, their profit is 46%. In year one, their operating profit is 20%. And in year two, their operating profit is now 13%. What does this story tell us then? 
Well, it tells us that actually their gross profit is a bit better. There is a slight improvement in gross profit. So not a lot, but gross profit is slightly improved. Now, gross profit only improves for one of two reasons. Either because we have increased our selling price because we have reduced our cost price. So we've reduced our cost of sales somehow, or a combination of the two. So we've got no information because I've just made those numbers up, but a selling price increasing, a cost of sale decreasing, or a combination of both would add to a gross profit and suggest reasons for that improvement. You mustn't fall into the trap of saying, oh, we probably sold more units. That isn't relevant. The number of units sold doesn't matter here. We're looking at the actual price from each unit. We're looking at the cost of each unit and seeing how that's changed. Now, the operating profit, as you can see, is much reduced. So what's happened? Something has gone seriously wrong. What do you think has happened in between gross profit and operating profit there? I'd say it's significantly lower and it does tell us something, but what does it tell us? I'll come back to that at the end, Mary, if that's all right. So operating costs. are increasing. Exactly right. And I know that because my gross profit is not the reason for that operating profit changing. The gross profit is just about the same. So I should then expect the operating profit to be about the same. And if it's not, it means that something has happened in this case, an increase in operating costs to actually cause the operating profit percentage to fall so significantly. So when you're looking at any change in operating profit, the first thing you do is say, well, does the gross profit impact it at all? In this case, no, because the gross profit was the same. So all the change had to be due to operating costs. OK, well done. So the other one, we've looked at capital employed, return on capital employed. So that's quite handy. That actually leads me into something else that I was uh, going to talk to you about. So we've looked at uh, this one, return on capital employed. We did a calculation on that one. So that's a really important one, as I said, make sure that you definitely know how to calculate that one. Other important ones, we've already done current and quick ratio. Uh, we've done current ratio. Quick ratio is the current ratio, but without the inventory in. And the reason we take the inventory out is because inventory isn't very quick to turn into cash. So if I had to quickly pay some bills, perhaps I can't quickly sell my inventory. And then the customers want 30 or 60 days credit before they pay. So it's not a very quick thing to turn inventory into cash. So we call it a quick or acid test ratio, strip out the inventory and say, if we had to pay things quickly, how much money can we get our hands on in the shorter term? And that uh, is a useful way of assessing that. Do make sure that you know each of these individually, these resource ratios, inventory holding period, receivable collection period, payable collection period, and so on. So each of these, how long do I hold the inventory for? How long before the receivables pay me? And how long before the payables get paid or come together for this working capital cycle. So if the inventory days, let's say, were 30, that means it takes me 30 days from buying an item to actually selling it. So I keep the goods in inventory for 30 days. So here at day naught, I buy the inventory. 
So let's imagine we've got a bookshop. We buy the books on day naught. The books sit on the shelf for 30 days before I find a buyer for them. When I do find a buyer, 30 days later, here I make the sale. And my customer says, I will buy from you, but I'd like some credit. I will pay you in 15 days time. So these are my receivable days. So that shows how many days it takes before I collect the money from my customer. Oh, I don't know why I've drawn that line so long. Just shorten that a little bit. There we go. So a total of 45 days there. So there's 45 days between me buying the inventory and actually getting any money in from my customer. So this is where the cash comes in after 45 days. Now that gets balanced out with the fact that when I do buy the inventory on day naught, the supplier says I can take some credit. Maybe the supplier lets me pay after 20 days. So these are my payable days. So here I have the cash going out. And the working capital cycle measured in days is the difference between the cash coming in and the cash going out. So here it's the gap. This part was 20 days, but it was 45 days before cash came in. So cash comes in after 45, but it has to go out after 20. So there is a gap, a little dotted line there of 25 days. And what that 25 days then shows me is I need to get some money from somewhere in order to be able to pay the supplier after 20 days when the cash only comes in after 45. I've got to have an overdraft maybe to fund that 25 day gap so I can pay for things before I get the money in. So the working capital cycle measures exactly that. Sometimes it's called the cash operating cycle. And it's important that you know how to calculate the various bits in there in terms of the inventory, the receivables and the payables periods. So do make sure that you learn those ratios. As a general rule, maybe it helps. You can see that in each one, you're taking the statement of financial position item divided by the profit and loss item. So then if you know that, you can then think, okay, well, if I know that, then if it's an inventory period, the relevant things for inventory are the inventory and the cost of sales. If I was dealing with the receivable days, the relevant things would be the receivable figure and the sales figure. So you can almost sort of deduce what your ratios are. And the multiplying by 365 at the end is simply turning it into a number of days. So there's some important ones to make sure that you learn. We've done an asset turnover based on net assets. So we already know about that one. We can equally do an asset turnover based on non-current assets if we were asked to. That would be how we do that. We've done gearing. And uh, the other one that's quite important, I suppose, then is an interest cover. And I believe that we see an interest cover when we get onto task seven, which we'll do next week. So interest cover is the operating profit compared with the finance costs. And that one shows me how able I am to pay the interest. So let's say the operating profit is 100 and the interest is 10. I could actually pay my interest 10 times. If I wanted to, I don't need to, I only need to pay it once, but I could pay it 10 times if I wanted to. If the following year, my profit's taken a bit of a downturn, I've got rising energy costs, haven't we? Rising costs generally. So maybe my profit next year is only 60 pounds, but the interest hasn't changed. I've still got to pay that. If anything, maybe the interest has gone up because interest rates are increasing, aren't they? So I've got more interest to pay and yet less profit to pay it out of. Why am I doing that on the calculator? That was very lazy. So that comes to four times there then. So before I could pay the interest 10 times over. Now I can only pay it four times over. So the interest cover has worsened. If that was year one and that is year two, there has been a worsening in interest cover. I'm less able to pay the interest cover than I was before. OK, so our plan for this evening was interpretation, 
It was understanding the calculations, of course, in any question that we might give you to practice. It's not going to include a calculation for every one of these. So the one that we picked out in this mock, it had four to calculate. But we've now run through at least a few more of them just to revise them. And you will then see in next week's lesson some calculations and some discussion around some more of those in task seven. So I think this task sets you up quite nicely, ready for next week. Do make some time perhaps between now and next week just to revise these again, and then it will make next week's lesson even more enjoyable. Okay, so we're going to leave it there. Um, I'm not sure that it is me taking the lesson next week. I have a feeling it might be somebody else, but I will tell them that uh, our plan is to cover task number seven. So um, do hang around now if there is anything that you have any questions about, anything else that I can help you with. Otherwise, you are free to go. I'm going to end the session here. I'm going to end the recording now. But it's been my pleasure to talk you through that task and that topic. And um, I shall look forward to seeing you in some future classes. Thank you.